Well, there are periods in Australian history when we might have gone down a more radical path. Could we go down that path once the pandemic passes? After all, some of the emergency policies launched to respond to the COVID crisis, they could remain in place. Could those measures entrench government more deeply across the economy and society? Well, we've been here before. Remember after World War II, the statist, overregulated, high taxation regimes deemed essential during the war, well, they lasted after 1945. Food, clothing and petrol rationing, for instance, they persisted for several years. Still, Australians chose liberalism over socialism. That's the subtitle of a new book, A Liberal State. It's written by David Kemp. It's the fourth of five volumes on the history of liberalism in this country. Now, David's career spans academia and politics. He's been a professor of politics at Monash University and the vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Melbourne. And he was a federal liberal MP from 1990 to 2004 and a cabinet minister in the Howard government. David, welcome to Between the Lines. Thank you very much, Tom. Good to be with you. Now, before we address the government's responses to the COVID crisis, let's talk about your multi-volume series on Australian liberalism since 1788. Summarise succinctly your thesis. In terms of personal freedom and economic freedom and uh, concern for uh, the well-being of individual people, Australia is certainly one of the most liberal countries in the world. It, it may be the most liberal. And if it is, that's a consequence of its foundation at a particular moment in Australian history, uh, which is uh, called the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment was in Britain and Europe, and Australia became perhaps the world's greatest experiment in implementing Enlightenment ideas about personal freedom and government in the interests of everyone and the equality of all people as members of a common humanity. When democracy was established in Australia in the 1850s, those ideas became the basis for the policies of democratic governments, and I suppose you could say they became the basis for Australia's success in implementing personal freedom and civil liberties, economic freedom, freedom of association, legal trade unions, humanitarian policies, universal education and so forth. Um, these were ideas in which the well-being of each individual person was the basis of policy and that's why we call them liberal. And today those ideas are embedded in our institutions and our culture but along the way, liberalism has confronted a whole lot of what we might call philosophical enemies, prejudice, selfish self-interest, illiberal ideologies, and the books tell the story of how liberalism progressed and what sort of conflicts it was involved in, and uh, particularly the conflict with socialism. And that's what uh, the current volume is about, the fact that in 1949, effectively, the Australian people chose liberalism over socialism. And now we'll get to that in a moment, but take us back to our foundation as a British colony. Now, in your first volume, which goes from 1788 through to 1860, you say that Governor Arthur Phillip was an Enlightenment man, even though he was charged with setting up a penal colony. Tell us more. Well, Arthur Phillip was a really remarkable man and... Um, he was seen as such when he was given command over that first fleet. Uh, he was somebody who brought to Australia the ideas of his generation. And those ideas were about the rule of law and the convicts came to Australia under law and they came with specific terms and sentences after which they were freed or pardoned. Uh, ideas of equal justice uh, Philip was very strong that Australia would never be a slave state or a slave country. Uh, there was a strong belief in the common humanity of all people, and there was a belief that government really should be there in the interest of all. Now, not everybody believed those ideas, but Philip was one of the people at the, the forefront of the intellectual culture of his day. He was a well-educated man, well-read, and he foresaw in Australia a great free country emerging was like going to the moon, going to Australia. And um, those ideas became the basis for the country's democratic politics. And if you fast forward to uh, Federation in 1901, um, what distinguishes 
say, the liberalism in the United States from the Australian experience. After all, David, many scholars believe that whereas, you know, the Americans fought a war for their independence against the British, we Australians were fed our independence by the British in the late 19th century. So what distinguishes the liberalism here from, say, the United States? Well, American liberalism is a a really um, confusing set of ideas for Australians, I think, uh, because in America, conservative means economic liberal, or what we probably call economic liberalism is the main character of that American conservatism, whereas what Americans call liberalism, most Australians would call something like uh, reformism or radicalism, but it's freer of, of the sort of liberal content that we understand in Australia and and really in Britain and Europe. The Americans have developed a unique terminology there. But the reason it didn't end up in a war uh, was because in Britain the Liberals were largely in power during that period um, and they weren't going to, to fight us over those matters and the Conservatives were frightened Australia might leave the empire and become a republic uh, as had happened with America in the 1780s. So it was quite mm. a, an interesting and a dramatic uh, moment in Australian history. Okay, now getting to your current volume, this period really from the Depression until 1966 when Menzies retires at a time of his choosing. David, I can imagine some of our listeners tuning in would say, well, look, if Australians chose liberalism over socialism during this period, how do you account for the Labor Party's embrace of the socialist objective in the 1920s and, of course, the New South Wales Labor Premier Jack Lang's support for the socialisation of industry? Well, it's not so much a matter of me accounting for that because, of course, those those events occurred before the 1949 election when I argued that Australia effectively chose liberalism over socialism. They had a big experience of socialism and, and that experience uh, was in that period when what I call the utopian socialists who uh, sent their ideas to Australia and were very active in Australia, particularly in the Labor Party, uh, after Federation, had given the Labor Party a socialist objective, which the New South Wales Labor Premier, Jack Lang, determined to put into effect and socialise all industry in New South Wales. Uh, and the Liberal movement, which was very um, weakened at that time by what had happened during the First World War and the terrible, horrific uh, humanitarian disaster that the First World War was, and the Great Depression had weakened people's faith in the liberal goals. Uh, and the person who really stood up for liberalism at the time, that is the priority and preeminence of the individual and for individual freedom and for an economy based on private enterprise and markets and prices, uh, was Robert Menzies. And uh, he spelt that those ideas out in his Forgotten People and campaigned on them in 1946 and 1949 and, of course, won that 1949 election and remained as Prime Minister for 16 and a half years. But Menzies was also an unashamed advocate for high tariffs, the white Australia restrictionist immigration policy, regulated labour markets. Is there a paradox there? Uh, well, I think Menzies uh, basically disliked most of those policies or went along with them because if there's one thing about Menzies, he wasn't a crash-through or crash politician. Um, he was somebody who saw that there were some very big issues that were too big to be dealt with easily and quickly, particularly as each of those policies was supported by the Labor Party and protection was, of course, supported by the country party with which he was in coalition. But he, he was especially sceptical of business demands for tariffs. He thought they preferred protection to competition and was rather scornful of that. He was certainly opposed to racial hatreds, and pursued policies to erode support for white Australia. Menzies was the person who both advocated very large-scale immigration and implemented a huge immigration program, which admitted many people to Australia. And, of course, he was supportive of uh, Jewish refugees from um, uh, Germany uh, during the war, and he admitted Asian students under the Colombo Plan, so he accustomed Australia to think beyond white Australia's. David Kemp is a former Howard Cabinet Minister and author of a multi-volume history of Australian liberalism, 
Now, David, the latest volume goes from 1926 to 66. What does that mean for your fifth and final volume? Uh, well, in the last 50 years, uh, the question really is what's happened to liberalism over that period? Um, where do we stand now in relation to um, all the principles of liberalism in terms of freedoms, uh, religious freedom, economic freedom, political freedom, press freedom? And um, is our economy um, still uh, basically market-based free enterprise economy with the growth of government? So those are the sort of issues I'll be dealing with in the final volume. Okay, let's turn finally to COVID, the COVID crisis. Now, all the available public polling evidence indicates that these premiers, most notably the Western Australian Labor Premier McGowan and, of course, the Victorian Premier Dan Andrews, they've handled the pandemic as well as possible. After all, a lot of lives have been saved. Now, you disagree that they've handled it well. You say that Andrews has presided over a Victorian disaster. How so? Uh, well, I think um, in, in the Victorian case... Um, most people will think of the mid-2020 nursing home disaster in which over 600 people died because of the failure of the government's quarantine system. Uh, and I certainly believe that that is the worst administrative failure that's occurred in Australian history. We've never had an administrative failure that has caused more than 600 deaths. Uh, but we've also had in both Victoria and Western Australia, and to some extent Queensland, but mostly in Victoria, extreme lockdowns, uh, which are not justified on and never were justified by the premiers themselves on health advice, but they were, I believe, evidence that the governments did not have confidence in their contact tracing and quarantine arrangements. And if they had had confidence, the lockdowns would not have been necessary. So, so those lockdowns were evidence of government failure. And the best indication that that is so uh, is that New South Wales pursued an entirely different policy without those random lockdowns and pursued a more open policy in which people could go about their lives because that government had confidence in its contact tracing and quarantine policies. So I am critical of the way in which some of the premiers acted because we know and one of the outcomes, I think, of, of this whole COVID crisis is how critical freedom is to people's well-being, uh, to their mental well-being, to their capacity to go about their lives and establish their relationships. And we've seen, in fact, contact by crisis support services um, last year uh, rose dramatically over the year. And I, I've just seen some latest figures on this, an increase between 14 and 21% over the previous year. So there are serious problems that arise for a society without freedom. And that's perhaps the strongest evidence that we need to return to conditions of responsible freedom. Um, and I think we will do that. Australians want that. They were highly cooperative. We showed ourselves to be a highly cohesive society when these demands, sometimes extreme demands, were placed on the community. But it's quite clear from various surveys that were done last year that Australians believe their democratic institutions need to be strengthened and revived and uh, that their freedoms need to be restored. And I expect that that will happen and that Australia will revert to the kind of society it was before the pandemic. That may not happen overnight, but the vaccine certainly holds out a lot of hope. So when this is over, responsible government should do everything to ensure a, a true return to normal and recognise the vital importance of freedom, not just on economic issues, but our general well-being. David, thanks so much for being on Radio National. It's a great pleasure, Tom. Thank you. David Kemp, he's author of A Liberal State, How Australians Chose Liberalism Over Socialism. It's from 1926 to 1966. It's published by the Mianga Ha Press. It's an imprint of Melbourne University Publishing.